to sum up my first guest. Well, it's not easy. He's a writer and performer of comedy. He's an actor, a novelist, playwright, a travel journalist. He's also the very best of company. When asked which luxury he would take with him on desert island discs, John Cleese said, Michael Palin, please. <laughs> when told the object had to be inanimate, and Mr. Palin would therefore have to be stuffed, <laughs> John Cleese said, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, live and unstuffed, Michael Palin. Live and unstuffed. Yes. That's the way to be. Now, of all the things that we are listed there that you do, and do very well, all of them, a bit of a polymath, really. But the one a thing... polymath? Uh, oh, right. I polymath. I've done the dead parrot sketch and all that. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty polymath. Yeah, yeah. Pretty polymath. But, yeah. but what informs all of it is what I'd be right in saying, from your point of view, and from ours too, watching you, is, is, is humour, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it always creeps in. I mean, I, d I don't think there's a great difference between something that's essentially comic or serious. And people try to make this division. Today I'm going to be serious, today I'm going to be comic. I've never been able to do that. Yeah. Everything I try to do that's serious, the comedy creeps in. Yes. Um, and yes, I mean, comedy is something that I've always found the best way of dealing with life's problems, and it's made me a living, so I'm, I'm very pleased so really, with it. But I mean, you, you created, you're part of that team that, talking about humour, that created one of the, the, the great modern cults of humour, and that was, that was Monty Python. And it's interesting looking at a documentary you made called Comic Roots, in which you interviewed Spike Milligan, one of your great heroes. Yeah. And there was a great line that Milligan came out with there. Uh, when you asked him, how did it happen that they created, these yeah. four men, mm. three men, mm. created the goons? And yeah. he said, we had a very good summer. Yeah. It was like a good summer. Like a yeah. good summer. He said, that's it. It was a lovely <laughs> remark. It was a great remark. I mean, the goons it? took a lot out of Spike. He used to say, you know, I love writing them, but it wore me out. Yes. And, of course, the, the goons, to me, represented the most liberating form of humour. Yes. Uh, when I was young. And yes. there were a lot of very funny people around, but it was the goons that had developed a different form of humour. They could do things that other people wouldn't risk, you know, like knocking on the door. Hello, men. Hello, men. <laughs> I want to come in. I'll go and get the key. <laughs> and then there'd be 45 minutes of total <laughs> silence. <laughs> this didn't happen on the radio, unless it was just before the national anthem or something like that. You know, <laughs> you didn't have that kind of silence. So to me as a schoolboy, wanting somehow to sort of have some, some way of getting at this, this very sort of solid, serious edifice that was being lowered upon me, this was just a great... Uh, um, friend. I yes. felt the goons were my friends, you know, and I listened to it. Did you ever get to meet apart from Spike? Did you ever meet Sellers? No, I... I, I well, actually, yes, I, <laughs> I did once. And it was, it was very funny because I, I was talking to Spike about it in this comic roots. And um, he asked me just that. And I said, uh, oh, yes, yes, I saw, I saw Peter Sellers once. I, I passed him in the passageway at London Weekend. Very painful, says Spike. Um, <laughs> made me feel very foolish. <laughs> Good line. <laughs> Good line, yeah. <laughs> But the, the really embarrassing thing was, of course, I see my hero, and what do I say? Oh, hello, Peter. Oh, you. <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> and that was about it. I never had a chance to go back to I've got a normal voice, Peter. <laughs> Honestly. But, but again, it's interesting. I mean, I mean, if you take them, then, they were, the, they were the, the forerunners of all of modern comedy, in a sense, weren't they? Everybody owes their debt and the of allegiance to them. I, I suppose so, yes. It, it all uh, I mean, it goes back. That was liberating. They made a kind of breakthrough. Yeah. There were, there were, I mean, there was, I think, Hancock, Gorton. Yeah, yes, yes, but, I mean, it started, yeah. it started mm. there. Uh, but, I mean, it, so Python, therefore, was it the same, a very good summer? Was that what it was? Yes, I, I, what Spike meant, I think, was that there's some moment which it all catches exactly. fire. And you don't quite know why it's going to happen, exactly. you don't know how long it's going to last, but you just ride it out. And Python, we wrote about, I think, 39 shows in uh, two and a half years. That was all. And innumerable albums were recorded, we, di we did a book. It was just because everything was bubbling through and we didn't stop to think about it. It was just, it was liberating, it was wonderful, we felt we had the chance to do this. We churned this stuff out and then, after about three series, people start beginning to think, well, is this really funny, or do I want to do it? Or, you know, you lose the uh, freshness, and you lose the impetus, and you lose the momentum. Yes. It's uh, that, that golden time you look back on, and what you don't realise at the time is it doesn't go on forever, and you can't reclaim it, can you? Um, nor there, is it golden, actually. Nor is it golden? I have golden? to say, you really? look at some of the Python shows, and some of them are absolutely awful. Really? Some of the things we did were just <laughs> totally embarrassing. <laughs> Whereas it's other little things that you, you know, you remember being... You, you, I'd forgotten all about, for instance, a wonderful 
silly sketch called the fish slapping dance. Oh, I love that. Um, <laughs> all it was was me in, 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 you know, sort of shorts, explorer shorts and a pith helmet with John by the side of this canal. And the music plays and I go up to John and I slap him very lightly on the side of the face with these little pilchards. <laughs> Comedy detail there. Pilchards, pilchards. Were, yeah. <laughs> Tried herrings, no latter. No, no. Anyway, pilchards. <laughs> Music stops, I bow, John gets this great pike. <laughs> out from behind his back, swap, knocks me straight into the canal. Now, I only tell this because when we rehearsed it, the canal was full. When we actually filmed it, a boat had gone through, the canal lot was empty. I fell 15 feet. <laughs> My pith helmet filled with water. I thought I was going to, you know, that was it. I thought I was submerged. What a way to die. I remember thinking, oh, well, my whole life flashed before me, but... <laughs> Did that you, was no good. Did you, uh, that's a wonderful <laughs> sketch. One of my favourite sketches, too. Because I mean, the thing about that, it's just silly and absurd. You know what's going to happen, don't you? you know, but but you, see, yes. you laugh, you laugh yeah. at the anticipation. Yes, it, it, it doesn't bear any analysis at no. all. And I think probably the best humour is like that. Probably. What about environment? I mean, Yorkshire itself. You, you've drawn great strength from it, great, great humour from it, in Python and various other things that, you, that you've done. I mean, do you find it essentially a funny, funny place to grow up in? Well, I think any, anyone who takes themselves that seriously, the way Yorkshiremen do, is a very funny place to grow up in. You know, you get the two sides. You get the very serious Yorkshireman and you get the very funny Yorkshireman. A lot of great comedians have come from Yorkshire. And it was, I can remember going to cricket matches and football matches, and there would actually be banter from the stands with the people on the, uh, on the pitch, which doesn't happen quite so much now. No. You know, there'd be great silence at cricket matches at Bramall Lane. And so, get your hands out of your pockets, Lindwall! <laughs> Something like that, you know. <laughs> You, you got Python up there, didn't you? Yes. We, <laughs> I managed to persuade them that if we wanted to get some really good locations, we shouldn't use Dorking all the time. You know, we should go up to uh, the Yorkshire Moors. And uh, we persuaded them all to go up there. And um, I don't think they really liked it. <laughs> they thought it was a bit of a plot by Michael to get them up there. And John got particularly testy. I remember one day we filmed in a nightclub. Um, and it was early morning and they hadn't cleaned out the nightclub from the night before. <laughs> and John sort of got, sort of uh, did something, wanted to go wash. So he goes into the toilet and <laughs> sort of stamping around, he comes back and he said, not a single basin didn't have vomit in it. <laughs> <laughs> Six basins. Anyway. Um, <laughs> well, we did some quite nice things up there. We did, we did things that I think amused the locals because... Uh, uh, <laughs> We, we, um, we did one sketch which was called uh, The Batley Towns Women's Guild Reenact the Battle of Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Ridiculous thing. <laughs> Set in a muddy field high up on, on, on the moors. And we're all in drag with handbags and little hats on and scarves. And we all rush in and beat the hell out of each other, you know, and all grapple in the, in the mud. And it's very, very silly and that nothing really happens. Anyway, we did that, got to the end of it, and we say, right, John said, so um, where do we go now? Where do we clean up? I said, oh, back at the hotel. I said, the hotel's two hours away. I well, said, you know, there's nothing else to do. He said, look, we're here, we're filthy, I'm c covered in mud, where on earth am I going to clean this stuff off? Of course, if he gets, he's got a handbag and he's wearing <laughs> lipstick and makeup and all that. So they go and they find a local farmer. And they say, would he mind if some actors uh, came and used his bathroom? just to clean up a bit. <laughs> They've been out in the field. He said, oh, no, that's all right. And then he saw these people, six big lads, all in drag, coming in. <laughs> their tights in tatters, you know, their skirts the wrong way around, bras ripped, going into his bathroom. I mean, the thing, you've said there that, there's, you know, looking back on Python, that something didn't work. But the fact of the matter is that, that nowadays, I mean, wherever you go, no matter what you've done, and you've moved on, as you all have, a, a pace from all that time, it remains still in the, in the eyes, in the memories of, of all the people who saw it. So you're on this, these travels now. You're going around, around the world. Sure. D does that follow you around still? The, are you recognised wherever you go because of N that? Not really. I mean, most of the world is still... Or, well, the, the journey I recently did around the Pacific, it's a sort of python-free zone, most of that. <laughs> but we did. It started very badly because we were on this little island, little diamede, in between Russia and America. Extraordinary. Just a bleak rock sticking out of the water there, they hunt whales, they've been asked if they want to move, but no, they want to stay on this little island. And we filmed with the Eskimos all day, and I thought, this is really where I, I've really gone to the ends of the earth here, no one will ever, ever have been here before. And at the end of the day, we're going to get this whale skin boat, which they provided for us, a little Eskimo group comes, shuffles up to me, I think it's going to be a sort of traditional Eskimo farewell. And they said, are you the guy from Monty Python and the Holy Grail? <laughs> I thought, well, here, you know, in the middle of the Bering Strait, they've seen the knights who say, Nee! So it's, uh, 
can't that... get away. But the rest of it, after that, it was uh, Chinese. The Ch uh, Python isn't well known in, in China. But yet. Give it time, <laughs> yes. Give Mr. Murdoch time to beam satellites yeah, in there, and it will be. Uh, and finally, one other thing that interests me uh, about you, knowing you, you know, so personally as well as professionally, um, you're such a good temper, good natured man, basically. I mean, have you ever lost your temper? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I lose my temper quite frequently, yeah. usually in the privacy of my own home, you know. <laughs> my wife reads these things in the paper about Michael being very nice, and she says, they should come and interview me. <laughs> <laughs> Never lose his temper. Oh, yes? <laughs> it's usually with inanimate objects, like, you know, something sort of sticks, a towel rail that doesn't quite stick. Oh, I know And you get very angry, and you pull it down, the whole rail goes spinning off, and it goes through the window and breaks the glass anyway. But I did, I, I remember she losing my temper once on a, on a python shoot, and I... Uh, we, were making, we were making the Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and I was given the rather unrewarding part of Mud Eater. And all that Mud Eater had to do it was this sort of uh, medieval village, plague village, and I had to sort of crawl across in front of John and Graham, come to a certain spot and start eating mud. And that's not easy for a start, but the props men said, don't worry, Mike, you know, it's going to be chocolate. It won't be mud, it'll be chocolate. Now, you try and tell chocolate from mud you know, when you crawl for you know, 100 yards. I didn't know. I was just getting a bit of chocolate, mostly mud. Anyway, I had to do this endlessly, largely because the other two got it wrong each time. And eventually, I'd done it seven times, and I was a bit twitchy. And on the they said, want one more take. I said, why? Why another take? So Terry Gilliam said, well, we've got this really nice sort of the sun just glinting off, uh, off the armour. It's really nice. And it just goes, I said, damn it! And I just went, and I went, and I threw myself in the air, threw myself on the ground, just wriggled around in the mud like this. <laughs> And there was a slight pause, and John and Graham just bl broke into uh, a spontaneous applause. I got a little round <laughs> them and the crew. It was, it was very nice. There's nothing worse. John was it. so pleased. He was always losing his temper. Uh, <laughs> very well, too, actually. Michael Pelly for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Michael Pelly. <laughs> <laughs>